Well, greetings, brethren. It's really nice to have this opportunity of speaking with you on the day of Pentecost, one of God's annual festivals. You know, it's really important that on these special festival occasions, we go back to God's Word and we review the very plan and purpose that God has. That we review the meaning of these days, the examples that God gives us uh, telling us about these occasions. Uh, So we're going to start here in Leviticus chapter 23, the place where God outlines the annual festivals. As the children of Israel had been brought out of Egypt uh, by Moses, uh, God gives them this instruction here as we find in Leviticus 23 and verse 1, And the Eternal said unto Moses, Speak unto the children of Israel and say unto them, Concerning the feasts of the Eternal. These are God's feasts, not simply the feasts of the Jews. Concerning the feasts of the Eternal, which you shall proclaim to be holy convocations, even these are my feasts. Now, the first one that is mentioned is the weekly Sabbath. Six days, uh, work is to be done. The seventh day is the Sabbath. It's a holy convocation. That means we assemble before God. It's a holy convocation. You shall do no work. It is the Sabbath of the eternal in all your dwellings. Then we're told in verse 4, These are the festivals, these are the feasts of the eternal, even holy convocations, which you shall proclaim in their seasons. You know, the Sabbath is a weekly occasion. And you know when it comes because when the sun sets on Friday, it's, it's the Sabbath. But the annual holy days must be proclaimed or announced. And they must be announced or proclaimed in their seasons. The first that God mentions here is the 14th day of the first month at evening or literally between the evenings at twilight, as some translations render it. That is the eternal's Passover. And on the fifteenth day of the same month is the Feast of Unleavened Bread unto the Eternal. Seven days you must eat unleavened bread. The first day you have a holy convocation. And then we're told in verse uh, in the next verse, in verse 8, that on the seventh day you shall have a holy convocation. Then God went on to tell Moses that speak unto the children of Israel and say unto them, When you come into the land which I give you, and shall reap the harvest thereof, you shall bring a sheaf of the firstfruits of your harvest unto the priest. Now, here was a part of the instructions that did not apply in the wilderness. You know, Israel in the wilderness had no harvest to reap. Uh, They were eating manna that God was providing for them day by day. So they couldn't offer a sheaf of the first fruits of the grain harvest to God because there was no grain harvest. But the instructions were added in as he went through. He talked about the Passover. And then the following day after the Passover is the beginning of the days of unleavened bread. And that lasts for seven days. Then he adds in the instruction, when you come into the land. Now, we're going to see how that applies uh, in a very specific way in just a few moments. You know, this year, uh, just because of the way the Days of Unleavened Bread fell, there are those who have become confused about how to properly count Pentecost. Because Pentecost is unique among the Holy Days in that it must be counted. Uh, All the others are set on a specific day of a specific month. But notice we're told here, when you come into the land that I give you and reap the harvest, then you bring a sheaf of the first fruits. Uh, He says the priest will wave the sheaf uh, to the Lord to be accepted for you, and he does so on the morrow after the Sabbath. Now this is in the context of the days of unleavened bread. So it is the morrow after the, the Sabbath or Sunday, as we would uh, term it, that is the time during the days of unleavened bread that the priest waves the the sheaf. And then you offer that day when you have the sheaf, uh, he gives them the instructions of of the rest of the offering, and the details are are given here. And it says, notice in in the next verse here, verse 24, you shall eat neither bread nor bread nor parched corn, nor green ears, until the selfsame day that you've brought an offering unto your God. It shall be a statute forever. 
So Israel was not to partake of the fresh harvest. They were not to partake of any of the products of the new harvest until the first sheaf had been presented to God. Then he went on, that you shall come, uh, you shall count from the morrow after the Sabbath, from the day that you brought the wave sheaf, beginning with that Sunday during the days of unleavened bread, you shall count seven Sabbaths are to be complete. So you count seven weeks, beginning with Sunday, and you count seven complete weeks, uh, even unto the morrow after the seventh Sabbath shall you number 50 days. And that's where we get the word Pentecost, because Pentecost uh, comes from the Greek word that refers to 50, 50 days. You're to number 50 days. And then a new offering was to be presented, and two wave loaves were to be presented on that day uh, of Pentecost, that day the 50th. And we're told that uh, on that same day, uh, here in verse, uh, uh, verse 21, you shall proclaim on the selfsame day that it may be a holy convocation. So Pentecost was a holy convocation, and that's why we're gathered here today on the day of Pentecost. It is a holy convocation, but it is a day that is arrived at by counting. By counting seven Sabbaths, seven weeks, and on the morrow after the seventh Sabbath is the 50th day this day that we most commonly refer to by the New Testament term, Pentecost. Now, let's look a little further. You know, when God gives us instructions in His Word, He gives us a basis of understanding it. Sometimes things can be a little bit uh, confusing. Now, this year, when uh, the Days of Unleavened Bread uh, began as they uh, did, running from a Sunday through a Saturday, it has confused certain people. When do you begin the count for Pentecost? When is the day of the wave sheaf? Is it the Sunday that is the first holy day of the Days of Unleavened Bread? Or is it the Sunday after the last holy day? Well, the answer is provided by a very direct example in Scripture. Uh, if you go back to the book of Joshua, you remember the story that uh, uh, Moses called the people together and he instructed them that uh, uh, Joshua would lead them across into the promised land. And uh, uh, Joshua was given charge by Moses and then Moses died. And that's the end of the book of Deuteronomy. And the book of Joshua picks up the story uh, right after the death of Moses and Joshua was told in Joshua chapter 1 and verse 2, Moses, my servant, is dead. Uh, now, uh, therefore, arise and go over the Jordan. So we find that uh, Joshua uh, brought the children of Israel in. And we know exactly when they came in because uh, uh, they prepared to cross the Jordan River. And we're told in Joshua chapter 4 and uh, uh, verse 19, And the people came up out of the Jordan on the tenth day, of the first month, and they encamped in Gilgal, in the east border of, jo of, uh, uh, of Jericho, right across the Jordan River. And uh, when did they cross? They crossed just a few days before the Passover. They crossed on the tenth day of the first month. Now, if you go back to the instructions God originally gave concerning the Passover in Exodus chapter 12, the tenth day of the first month was the day in which the lambs were chosen out uh, and set aside, the lamb that was to be offered by each family uh, at the Passover. So it was on the tenth day that they came up out of the Jordan River. You remember uh, the river uh, stopped, it parted. They came up, and uh, chapter 5 uh, tells the story. You see, the, uh, as the uh, children of Israel came in, God told them, uh, instructed Joshua, in, uh, recorded in verse 2, to prepare sharp knives and to circumcise the children of Israel. Now, they had not practiced circumcision in the 40 years of wandering in the wilderness. There was a breach of the covenant. And Israel was punished for that period of time. And now that they have entered into the promised land, they are uh, to renew that. And it starts here with circumcision. And then we're told that they were circumcised. And, you know, sometimes people say, oh, well, how long would it have taken? Wouldn't it have taken, uh, you know, some long period of time? When it says that Joshua 
uh, did this, it means that Joshua supervised it. It didn't mean that Joshua performed the circumcision personally of thousands and thousands of men. Uh, you remember God had organized, had, had inspired Moses to uh, establish a structure. You had captains of ten and captains of fifty and captains of a hundred and captains of a thousand. Undoubtedly, uh, this system was used and so the amount of time that the circumcisions would have taken would have been a very short time because uh, uh, you're probably looking at uh, nobody having to uh, uh, carry out circumcision on uh, more than uh, ten households of, of men use, utilizing the captain system. But now notice that uh, they were circumcised and uh, then we're told uh, that... Uh, Verse, uh, verse 8, it came to pass when they had done circumcising all the people that they abode in their place in the camp until they were whole. And the Lord said to Joshua, This day have I rolled away the reproach of Egypt. Speaking of, of circumcision, uh, you're no longer an unclean people, now you are clean. I have rolled away the reproach of Egypt. And that's where the name Gilgal came from because it had to do with a rolling. That's the, the significance of the name. So the children of Israel encamped in Gilgal and they kept the Passover on the 14th day of the month at twilight in the plains of Jericho. And they ate of the grain. Now the King James translation adds in old corn, but if you look at uh, other translations, that's not... Uh, the literal Hebrew doesn't say old corn. And uh, in fact, the Jewish translation uh, renders it the very opposite, the new corn or the new grain. And most translations uh, do it that way, just uh, they ate of the grain of the land. On the morrow after the Passover, they ate unleavened cakes and parched, ca and parched uh, ears in the self same day. And the manna ceased on the morrow after they had eaten of the, old, uh, of the grain in the land. And they didn't have manna anymore. They now ate of the fruit of the land of Canaan that year. Now, think about the, the significance of this. We're told here that it was on the morrow after the Sabbath. That, or the morrow after the Passover, rather. It was the morrow after the Passover that they ate of the grain of the land. Now this year we had a situation where the Passover came on the weekly Sabbath and the first holy day of unleavened bread came on Sunday. Remember in Leviticus 23 when the instructions were given about the holy days and the children of Israel were told about the Passover, told about the days of unleavened bread and then they were told when you come into the land which the Lord your God shall give you then you're to bring a sheaf and a sheaf of the first fruits. And the priest is to wave it for you before the eternal. And we're told very specifically that Israel was forbidden to eat of the grain in the land until they had offered the sheep. Now you see, if you accept that, that solves the whole issue very clearly. The uh, children of Israel had arrived and they celebrated the Passover and the following day was the day that the wave sheaf was presented wave before God and then they could begin to eat of the grain of the land. In fact, we're told very clearly uh, later on in the book of Joshua that uh, uh, in uh, Joshua chapter... Uh, uh, in uh, Joshua chapter 21 and other places that... Uh, uh, the uh, instructions that Moses had given uh, to, uh, uh, to Joshua, had given to the children of Israel, Joshua did not fail to, uh, to, to keep any of those. You know, God gave them rest and uh, uh, the children of Israel inherited and we're told that uh, uh, Joshua observed all the things that Moses uh, had instructed him to do. And when you understand that, you would, have to, you would have to conclude, you see, that the very first thing that Joshua did when he crossed into the Jordan River, he followed God's instructions. Joshua uh, had the children of Israel circumcise, be circumcised, and then they followed the instructions of Leviticus 23, when you come into the land, okay, they had just crossed into the land. They offered the sheaf of the first fruits. 
And they followed the instructions that God had given. And so the only way that you could observe the Passover and then the morrow after the Passover you could begin to eat of the grain is the fact that the Passover came on a Sabbath and the Sunday, the first holy day of unleavened bread, was the day that they presented the wave sheaf. Otherwise, they would have been eating of the grain. You know, there was no old grain available to them. The old grain was stored up in the city of Jericho. It was the grain in the field. You had all these people, and they were not free to eat or partake of the harvest of the land of Canaan until they had presented to God what was His. That sanctified the harvest. That set it apart. That put God first. And we're very clearly told that Joshua uh, observed all of the things that Moses told him to do. Uh, In fact, Joshua did not fail to keep any of the instructions that Moses had given him. And clearly what was given in Leviticus chapter 23 is something that Joshua carried out. Now let's go back and let's understand a few more things uh, about the events of what could be called the first Pentecost. Let's go back to the book of Exodus and uh, in chapter 19 we find where the uh, children of Israel came uh, there to uh, Mount Horeb as it was sometimes known or Mount Sinai as it is better known. And uh, uh, they were, were told exactly when they arrived and Uh, As we look at this carefully, it doesn't use the word Pentecost, but uh, as we follow the account carefully, we can see that the giving of the law from Mount Sinai came on the first of this uh, succession of celebrations through all these centuries, uh, the first uh, one that was the day of Pentecost because they had been spared in Egypt. The death angel had passed over the homes of the Egyptians uh, on the Passover. Uh, The children of Israel organized during the daylight portion of the Passover. And then when the sun set, that began the 15th day of the first month, that evening that we call the night to be much observed, that commemorates the beginning of the Exodus. The children of Israel began their journey out of Egypt. And they... Uh, made that journey over a period of seven days when they came to the Red Sea. God parted the Red Sea and they came across the Red Sea. They made the exodus during those uh, seven days of unleavened bread. Now we're told in uh, Exodus chapter 19 and verse 1, in the third month, when the children of Israel were gone forth out of the land of Egypt, the same day they came unto the wilderness of Sinai. They were departed from Rephidim and were come to the desert of Sinai. And they pitched in the wilderness and Israel encamped before the mount. Now, it says that they came on the same day that they uh, left Egypt. Well, that would have to be uh, the day of the, uh, the day of the week because quite a number of days had gone by, weeks had gone by. They came in the third month. Now, it's interesting uh, because... Pentecost always comes during the first week of the third month. Did you know that the Bible tells you the day of the original Passover in Exodus? Uh, It tells you the day of the week that the children of Israel began their journey out of of Egypt. Did you realize that in the year of the Exodus, uh, the Passover occurred on a uh, Wednesday and that the, the first day of unleavened bread, the beginning of the Exodus, occurred on a Thursday, exactly the same way that it fell during the year of Christ's crucifixion. Uh, now you may say, well, how do you know that? Well, the Bible tells the story. It gives us the account. We're told, for instance, we're told, you have to put a couple of things together, but you're told in Exodus chapter 16 that the children of Israel uh, took their journey. They came to the wilderness of sin. This is Exodus 16, 1. And they arrived here on the 15th day of the second month after their departing out of the land of Egypt. Okay, we know that they arrived on the 15th day of the, uh, of the second month. Now, what are, what are we told? Well, uh, God said to the children of Israel, they're, they're hungry, you know, or they have run out of food, and they begin to murmur and to complain and to tell Moses, you brought us out here to let us starve to death. Well, that was pretty ridiculous, uh, and they should have known better, but they were complaining. And God told Moses in verse 4, I will rain bread from heaven, and the people shall go out and gather at a certain rate every day, that I may prove them whether they will walk in my law 
or not. And uh, he gave him instructions that uh, the manna was to come for six days, and on the sixth day they were to gather up double and prepare uh, for the Sabbath. Moses then went on to tell them in, in verse 8, uh, This shall be, when the Lord shall give you in the evening. And the word here is exactly the same word uh, that is used in regards to the Passover. It means twilight, literally between the two evenings. The Lord shall give you in the evening at twilight flesh to eat, and in the morning bread to the full, for He hears your murmurings. And so God told Moses uh, here in verse 12 that speak to the children of Israel and say, At evening, at twilight, shall you eat flesh. And in the morning you shall be filled with bread and you shall know that I am the Lord. So it came to pass at twilight that the quails came up and covered the camp. And in the morning the dew lay round about the host. And when they got up and they looked and they saw this, they said, what's that? And that's the Hebrew word. The Hebrew word for what's that is manna. So uh, they gathered it. And it goes through that they gathered it day by day. And uh, verse 21, they gathered it every morning. And then verse 22, it came to pass on the sixth day, they gathered twice as much. Now, let me ask you something. Let's, how does this prove what day the Exodus was? Well, we're told that this event occurred, their murmuring occurred, on the 15th day of the second month. Now, what day of the week was that? Well, it's very apparent. God told them, at twilight, I will give you flesh to eat, and in the morning, I'll give you manna. We know that the beginning of Israel harvesting the manna had to be on a Sunday, because Otherwise, they couldn't have harvested it for six days and then rested on the seventh day. God was identifying very clearly which day is the Sabbath. Well, the only way you can harvest for six days and rest on the seventh day, and that designates the week and that designates the weekly Sabbath, is you have to start on Sunday. That's why the quail came up at twilight. When sun set on Saturday, the new day, the first day of the week, had begun. And so right after sunset, during that period of dusk or twilight, is when the quail came. They gathered it Saturday evening, right after sunset. Which, by the way, is something that shows you uh, that twilight refers to the beginning of the next day. That's why we know that the Passover uh, is observed at twilight. It's observed at the beginning of the 14th. One of the reasons we know that, but that same word is used here. You have the Bible's definition. You know, the Bible defines its own terms. You don't have to go back to the Talmud or to some uh, obscure source because then what you're getting is the interpretation of men. But the Bible interprets itself and it gives us the keys to understand. So it was the 15th day of the second month was a weekly Sabbath. Uh, the next morning uh, they gathered uh, the quail that evening right after sunset during the period of dusk. Early the next morning, Sunday morning, they went out and here was manna. And it continued uh, through the six days. Now, if you just want to lay out a little chart, uh, you can prove to yourself that if the 15th day of the second month was a Saturday, then if you just count back, remember the first month always had 30 days. Hebrew months in the early part of the year always alternate between 30 and 29 because uh, the, the cycle of the moon, its, it's uh, rotation uh, uh, or revolution around the earth uh, is basically 29 and a half days. So if you keep in cycle with the moon, you have 30 days, 29 days, 30 days, 29 days. The first month always starts out with 30 days. Well, if you just count back, 15th day of the second month is a Saturday. If you count back, you'll find that the 15th day of the first month was a Thursday. And uh, the Passover came in the year of the Exodus, the same way it did in the year that Jesus was crucified. Therefore, when we're told in Exodus chapter 19 that the children of Israel uh, came here uh, in the third month, you know, right at the beginning of the third month, and they arrived on the very same day that they had left Egypt. In other words, they arrived on a Thursday. And you can calculate it through, and it uh, uh, comes out exactly as to the time when seven Sabbaths, seven weeks would have elapsed. And uh, in fact, Moses was told here in Exodus chapter 19, he went up and he communed with God in the mountain, and God told him uh, when he came back down the mountain to assemble the people, and uh, uh, to tell them in Exodus chapter 19 and verse 10, Today and tomorrow 
They're to sanctify themselves. They're to wash their clothes. They're to prepare and be ready against the third day. For the third day, the Lord will come down in the sight of all the people on Mount Sinai. See, they arrived on a Thursday. They were to sanctify themselves, then Friday and Saturday. And then on the third day, Sunday, which was the 50th day, that's when they would have received the law. That's when God spoke unto them uh, with the words of the Ten Commandments. And God gave His law. Now, it's interesting what was, what was uh, given under the Old Covenant because what we're told uh, in terms of the Old Covenant uh, in Exodus chapter 19 and, and uh, verse 5, If you will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then you shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine, and you shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words that you're to speak to the children of Israel. They were to be a kingdom of priests. They were to be a holy nation. They were to receive God's blessing. Now, one of the things, if you read through here, there is no statement made of a promise of the Holy Spirit. God had not poured out His Spirit. He did not pour out His Spirit there at Mount Sinai. He gave the law. And in the New Testament, you can point to a specific verse where Peter said, Repent, be baptized, you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. There is something specific you can do that will result in God giving you the Spirit as a gift. That promise was not made in the Old Testament. Now, there were individuals who had the Spirit, and that's made plain as you go through the account. Uh, let's go back to Numbers chapter 11. And let me show you something that uh, uh, we've often sort of read over or maybe not uh, paid particular attention. In Numbers chapter 11, we find that the people were complaining and it displeased the Lord. And Moses uh, came to the Lord and he told, told him, verse 14, I am not able to bear all of this people alone. It's just too much. It's too heavy. He just told God, he said, I just can't handle it anymore. I can't put up with all this. I'm having to do it all by myself. And God told him uh, he had a solution for the problem. Uh, Moses was told by God, recorded here in verse 16, uh, Gather unto you seventy elders, seventy men of the elders of Israel, whom you know to be the elders of the people, and bring them to the tabernacle of the congregation, that they may stand there with you. And I will come down and talk with them, and talk with you there. And I will take of the Spirit which is upon you, and I will put it upon them. And they shall bear the burden of the children with you. You won't have to bear it alone. So God here told Moses that He was going to give the Spirit, the same Spirit that He had given to Moses, He was going to give it to 70 of the elders. Moses was told to pick out 70 elders. So as you come on through the story, and you get to verse 24, Moses went out and he told the people the words of the Lord and he gathered the 70 men of the elders of the people and he set them round about the tabernacle. And the Lord came down in a cloud and he uh, spoke and took of the spirit that was upon him, upon Moses, and gave it to the 70 elders. And it came to pass when the spirit rested upon them, they prophesied and did not cease. There was a miraculous outpouring. There was miraculous evidence that these men had received the Spirit of God. Now what we're told is two of the men were a little late showing up. They hadn't gotten there yet. Eldad and Medad. And somebody came uh, and uh, uh, told Moses and, and uh, the others there about this because at the time when these elders had gathered and God had poured out the Spirit on the men gathered there before the tabernacle, two of them that were still back in the camp, Eldad and Medad, the Spirit was poured on them at the same time and they began to prophesy. And this created quite a stir because they were right there in the midst of the people. Uh, the Spirit rested upon them, verse 26. Uh, they were of them that were written. Their name was on the list that Moses had made out, but they hadn't gotten to the tabernacle yet. They prophesied in the camp. There came a young man and he told Moses, he said, Eldad and Medad are prophesying in the camp. And Joshua 
You know, Joshua was very loyal to Moses and really uh, uh, when he heard that, he said, My Lord Moses, forbid them. Tell them to quit that. And Moses said to Joshua, he said, Are you jealous for my sake? I wish to God that all the Lord's people were prophets and that the Lord would put His Spirit upon them. You know, notice here what Moses said. Because what we're going to see is Moses was anticipating something. Moses had been asked to select 70 men, elders of the people, gather them before God, and God would give His Spirit to these men. And there was a miraculous outpouring that occurred at that time. Joshua was jealous for Moses, and he said, Well, Eldad and me, Dad, you know, they're back in the camp, and everybody's seeing them, and, and uh, why don't you, you want me to go back and just tell them to quit? You see, he was jealous. He sort of wanted Moses to be the only one that stood out, and Moses said, I don't feel that way, Joshua. He said, I wish that all the Lord's people did prophesy. I wish they all had that Spirit upon them. But you know, that spirit was not readily available to all. Now we could go through the account, and you can read back in 1 Samuel, of a specific time when the, Holy, when the Spirit came upon Saul and his heart was changed to another man. Uh, you can read through various examples and accounts. Uh, you know, Peter tells us back in uh, uh, 1 Peter that uh, the, uh, uh, the prophets spoke of those things that the uh, Spirit of Christ in them did reveal. Uh, he tells us in 2 Peter that uh, uh, Scripture didn't come just by the will of man, that the prophecy of old time was not just simply somebody's idea, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved of the Holy Spirit. So we find that there were individuals during the period of the Old Testament that had the Spirit. But that was an exception. The Spirit was not promised. The Spirit was not poured out on the day of Pentecost on all the people. Uh, there were a group of 70 men, uh, you know, a period of time later that, the Spirit, that received God's Spirit and were able to stand with Moses and to help him and assist him. If you come through the story, about seven centuries, approximately 700 years, you come down to the time of Joel the prophet. And uh, we read of an interesting prophecy that Joel made that's recorded here in Joel chapter 2. That uh, notice here in Joel chapter 2 in verse, uh, verse 28. It shall come to pass in the last days or afterwards, some translations render it, uh, the last days. And that's the way it's quoted back in the New Testament. It comes to pass that I will pour out my Spirit upon all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. And also upon the servants and upon the handmaids in those days will I pour out my Spirit. And I'll show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness, the moon to blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord comes. Now what do we find? Joel anticipated and prophesied of a specific time. You know, Moses said, I wish all of God's people would prophesy. I wish all of God's people uh, would have the Spirit upon them. But that wasn't the case back then. Seven centuries later, Joel spoke of a time in the future. He said, it shall come to pass in the last days that I will pour out my Spirit upon all flesh. Not simply 70 elders, 70 men chosen from the elders of the people, but upon old and young men and women, there would be a miraculous outpouring. Well, Joel gives us more details. Moses expresses it as a desire. Joel gives it as a prophecy of an event that will happen. When you come back to the book of Acts, then we find the fulfillment, or at least the beginning of the fulfillment. And we're going to see something in just a few moments because this prophecy has a dual fulfillment and it applies to our time in the future, just the immediate future for us. Now notice back here in, uh, in Acts chapter 1, this is after Jesus' ascension into heaven. And we're told that uh, uh, what did the apostles and the other disciples do? 
There were about 120 of them all together, counting the women. These all, Acts 1.14, continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women, Mary the mother of Jesus, and with his brethren. And it came to pass in those days, Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples, and the number of which was about 120. And he goes on. Now, just follow it on through and come down to Acts chapter 2 and verse 1. When the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. You remember, Jesus spent 40 days. He uh, appeared to them on the day of the wave sheaf, on the Sunday during the days of unleavened bread. When they came to the tomb at sunrise on Sunday morning, the tomb was already empty. Uh, the stone was rolled back and they could look in and see that it was empty. Jesus appeared to them over a period of 40 days. And then He ascended to heaven. So when the day, the 50th, when Pentecost, 10 days later, when that day was arrived, God does things on schedule. They were all with one accord in one place. That's what they had been doing during this period since Jesus ascended. And suddenly, verse 2, there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. And it filled the house where they were sitting. And there appeared upon them clo uh, cloven tongues like fire. And it sat on each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, all of them. All 120, and they began to speak with other languages as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now, let's understand something. God is not the author of confusion. This was not some sort of, quote, Pentecostal tarry meeting. These people did not just sort of work themselves up into a, an emotional frenzy and then fall out with all sorts of uh, uh, carryings on and gyrations. No, they were seeking God. They were together with one accord in one place. They were seeking God in prayer day after day. And when the time came, when God's time came, then suddenly there came this sound of a rushing mighty wind. Suddenly the Spirit was poured out upon them. It happened when God was ready. It came on suddenly. It was not something that they sort of worked up and prepared themselves for in, a, uh, in an emotional sense. They prepared themselves for it in a spiritual sense. Now, this created quite a consternation. There were people in Jerusalem at the Pentecost season from all over the known world. And there were people who were living in Jerusalem who had grown up in other parts of the world, who had grown up speaking the various languages that were common all over uh, the uh, Middle East and even into Europe. And very soon, quite a stir came up in Jerusalem and people were saying, how is it that we hear these people speaking in the languages of the place where we were born? Aren't all these Galileans? Some of them said, oh, well, you know, they're just drunk and I don't, I don't understand what they're saying. Well, Peter stood up, as we're told here in Acts chapter 2, and he said... Uh, recorded here beginning in verse 15 of Acts 2. He said, these aren't drunken as you suppose. It's only the third hour of the day. It's nine o'clock in the morning. This is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last days, says God, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy and your young men shall uh, see visions and your old men shall dream dreams and on my servants and on my handmaidens I will pour out in those days of my spirit and they shall prophesy and I'll show wonders in the heavens above and signs in the earth beneath blood and fire and vapor of smoke the sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before that great and notable day of the Lord comes. It will come to pass that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now let me ask you a question. As we're going to notice, we're going to go back to Joel chapter 2 in just a few minutes. And we're going to notice that Peter quit quoting in the, in, in the middle of a verse. Peter quoted a portion of Joel's prophecy the portion of Joel's prophecy that was being fulfilled on that first Pentecost of the New Testament era. But it was not the complete fulfillment of Joel's prophecy. And that's what we're going to see in just a few moments. Now notice, uh, 
Moses, uh, Moses wished for a day. I, I, I would that all the Lord's people did prophesy. I wish they could all partake of the Spirit of God. Joel then, seven centuries later, prophesied of a time in the last days, says God, I will pour out my Spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Not just 70 of the elders, but everybody, young and old, men and women, would be able to receive this miraculous gift of the Holy Spirit. Now you come forward another seven centuries, and on the day of Pentecost, when it was fully come, and the disciples, uh, about 120 of them, were gathered together, God suddenly fulfilled that prophecy of Joel. He poured out the Spirit. Peter then quotes that prophecy from Joel and he tells those who were standing around who had been seeing all of this, he says, this is what Joel was writing about. Now let me ask you, brethren, as you read what Peter said, he quoted in the context that there would be miraculous things that would occur in the, in the context. Uh, specifically, he said, signs in the earth and signs in the heavens. He said the sun would become black, the moon would become blood red, and God would then pour out His Spirit. What did that mean to Peter's listeners on that day of Pentecost in 31 AD when they were standing there in Jerusalem in the courts of the temple and they heard Peter speak? Had they seen anything? You know, did, they, uh, did they, somebody pipe up and say, well, look, none of that happened. You're quoting what Joel said, but this can't apply to, to us because there haven't been any dramatic signs in the earth uh, or the heavens and, and the sun didn't turn black and the moon didn't turn red. Nobody said that. That wasn't an issue. The reason it wasn't an issue is because all Jerusalem knew that it had occurred. Remember the day of the Passover. Remember when Jesus was crucified. Remember what happened at noon the sun became black. Evidently, thick clouds gathered in and blotted out the sun for a period of three hours. From noon until 3 p.m., it was absolutely pitch black. What occurred at the end of that period of three hours of total darkness? What occurred at the time when Jesus died? We're told a great earthquake shook the whole area of Jerusalem. It was severe enough that we know two specific things that it did. One, it was so severe that it cracked open or, or caused to roll back stones that covered the tombs. There were tombs opened around the Jerusalem area. Uh, the uh, the uh, stones that sealed them were moved by the earthquake. Another thing we know that happened was that there was damage done to the temple. Uh, the uh, veil of the temple was torn in two. Evidently the stone lentil that uh, uh, was across the, uh, uh, across the top that, uh, from which hung this very heavy curtain, this heavy veil that separated the holy place from the holy of holies. That broke at the time of the earthquake and it ripped the, the curtain, it ripped the veil and now the holy of holies lay wide open. So there was an earthquake. That's about as big a sign as you can have in the earth. Uh, the sun was blotted out for a period of uh, uh, three hours. And uh, we're not told specifically the smoke and the fire, but I would uh, uh, conclude from this that as the heavy cloud cover came in, it looked like a storm. There was lightning flashing. Uh, there were evidently fires started in the environs. What about the other thing? What about the moon being turned to blood? You know, when a lunar eclipse takes place, and a lunar eclipse can only take place at the time of the full moon. It has to do with the placement of the earth, sun, and moon. Uh, in a lunar eclipse, the earth's shadow falls across the moon, and that can only occur uh, at the time of the full moon. Uh, a solar eclipse, on the other hand, can only occur at the time of the new moon, when the moon uh, comes between the earth and the uh, sun, and, and it blots out the sun. But when a lunar eclipse turns takes place, the moon turns red. Now, depending on various conditions, it can be more of a coppery red, or many times it is a blood red color. Did you know that astronomers who can calculate all of these eclipses, not a matter of some, uh, you know, of something I've calculated or some, uh, uh, somebody in the Church of God has calculated. Uh, astronomers have calculated, and, and you can check it up if you have access to books or even uh, type it in as a search on the Internet. There was 
a lunar eclipse on Wednesday night, April 25th, 31 A.D. It reached its peak about 9 p.m. In other words, the day of Jesus' crucifixion, at noon, it became dark, absolutely pitch black from noon until 3. And it was a scary and an eerie thing. At 3 o'clock, just before it began to, to lighten up, the earth shook, buildings were damaged, tombs were opened. That evening when the sun set, just after Jesus had been put in the tomb, and the full moon began to arise over Jerusalem, as the moon began to come up on the horizon and be visible, that full moon that signals the night to be much observed, an eclipse took place. The earth's shadow began to move across and the moon turned blood red. Now, all of this occurred from the sun being blotted out to the earthquake to the moon turning red. All of this occurred just within a few hours on the day of the Passover in 31 A.D., on the Wednesday uh, that was the Passover that year. When Peter quoted that prophecy of Joel, and he said, What you see around you is what Joel foresaw and prophesied centuries ago. God is pouring out His Spirit. And then He quoted those signs and, you know, everybody knew that those signs had taken place. And so here it was that Peter tied that in with Joel's prophecy. And then he went on and told them, you can receive the same gift. It's not just limited to 70 elders or 120 disciples. If you will repent and be baptized, you also can receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now, God doesn't pour out a great miraculous display every time the Spirit is given. But He has on certain occasions. And He certainly did, as we read uh, back, at, uh, back in those days at, uh, uh, when 70 of the elders were given the Spirit. We read about it here in Acts chapter 2. There was a miraculous outpouring. Brethren, there is yet to be a miraculous outpouring of the same thing. You see, what we... Uh, see here in Acts 2 is going to be replicated in the future. It's going to be at God's time. And let's, let, let's notice that as you go back to Joel chapter 2. Go back to Joel chapter 2 and uh, we find uh, the whole setting of, of Joel 2 and Joel 3 is the end time. Joel 2 verse 1 says, Blow the trumpet in Zion, sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord comes. It's near at hand. A day of darkness and gloominess, a day of clouds and thick darkness. He goes on and he describes that. And uh, uh, he talks about uh, these events. And he says... Uh, uh, in verse, uh, verse 10, The earth shall quake before them, the heavens shall tremble, the sun and moon shall be dark, the stars shall withdraw their shining. The Lord shall utter His voice before His army. And says the day of the Lord is great, it's very terrible, who can abide it? So He says, Come, turn to Me with all your heart, with fasting and weeping and mourning. Rend your hearts and not your garments. Talks about blowing the trumpet in Zion, verse 15. In verse 21, Fear not, O land, be glad and rejoice, for the Lord will do great things. Then he says in verse 23, Be glad then, you children of Zion, rejoice in the Lord your God. He that gives you the former rain moderately, he will cause to come down upon you the rain, the former rain, and the latter rain in the first month. Now, and the floors will be full with wheat. Now let's look at this matter of the latter rain and the former rain. The former rain came after the Feast of Tabernacles, right after, usually very soon after the uh, Feast of Tabernacles was over, the early rain came. And this moistened the land and made it possible to uh, plow and to sow the uh, grain crop. Uh, this was the uh, crop that was sown. And then uh, through the winter, the, uh, the grain was in the ground. And in the early spring, 
it began to rain again. This was the latter rain. That's what brought the uh, uh, the crop on uh, to maturity, caused the grain to the to head out, and uh, this was right before the Passover, the former rain and the latter rain. Now, the Bible uses the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Uh, the Spirit is compared to water, to rivers of living water. What occurred? on the day of Pentecost, recorded in Acts chapter 2, was the former rain spiritually. It was the first miraculous outpouring of the Spirit of God. And there were miraculous signs that accompanied it. When you go through Joel 2 and on into Joel 3, what you find is that the real context describing this outpouring is describing an event in the last days right before Christ's return. We've already read most of this and uh, uh, beginning in uh, verse 28 where God says it'll come to pass in the last days I'll pour out my spirit and uh, we're told here in verse 32 it'll come to pass that whoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be delivered for in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem shall be deliverance as the Lord has said and in the remnant whom the Lord shall call going right on in chapter 3 verse 1 behold in those days and in that time when I shall bring again the captivity of Judah and Jerusalem, I will gather all nations and bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat and plead with them for my people, for my heritage Israel. You see, the context is the final day of the Lord, the time of God's intervention, the time of God's judgment. It's a time when that results in the nations being gathered there before Jerusalem in the valley of Jehoshaphat, the uh, valley just outside of, of Jerusalem, and they will be uh, destroyed, as you read in other places, these armies. You know, a great dramatic event is going to occur yet ahead. Now, what we find right here, it's in the context of the end time, in the context of God's final intervention, that He's going to pour out His Spirit on all flesh. Just as there was a former rain. There was literally in ancient Israel a former rain and a latter rain that brought along the harvest. So also spiritually there was a former rain, the great miraculous outpouring that began the New Testament era and there's going to come a latter rain, a latter outpouring. Now, let's understand something about that. Is it a matter that we can sort of work it up? How do you experience that? You know, when you go back to the outpouring of the Spirit, the former rain, the early rain of God's Holy Spirit, when you go back to that occurrence on the day of Pentecost, you don't find that it was emotionally induced. You find that it was spiritually induced. It occurred at God's time. It occurred at God's time. When the day of Pentecost was fully come, the day the 50th, when it had actually arrived, when it was God's time, then suddenly the Spirit was poured out. What had the brethren, what had Peter and the others done to prepare? They couldn't control the timing, but they were responsible for whether or not they were ready, whether or not they were vessels fit for the Master's use. And so that's why you read in the, in the book of Acts that after Christ's ascension into heaven, uh, you read that uh, the disciples were gathered together. They returned from Jerusalem, uh, Acts 1 and verse 12. And what did they do in these intervening days? And remember, they didn't know specifically when it was going to be poured out. They were simply told, you go back and wait in Jerusalem until you are imbued with power from on high. Well, we're told in Acts 1.14, they continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with His brethren. They continued with one accord in prayer and supplication. They were unified and they were seeking God. And they were seeking Him with a whole, their whole heart. And you, as you go through the book of Acts, you read over and over about that phrase uh, that they were all in one accord. You see... As they gathered, if they were in one accord with God, they were going to be in one accord with one another. 
they were seeking God. They were seeking God in prayer and supplication, really crying out to God, really beseeching God, really seeking to draw close to God. And when God's time came, they were ready. Now, it's important that we understand some things about, uh, about this matter and about spiritual gifts. You know, as we, uh, uh, as we look here in uh, uh, going back, let's, let's go back to the book of Romans. We'll uh, go back here to chapter 15. Acts 5, or Romans 15, 1. We then that are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak and not to please ourselves. You see, the disciples were all gathered together with one accord in one place. They were spiritually unified. They were unified first and foremost with God. And that was the basis of their unity with one another. We that are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak, not to please ourselves, not to have a self-centered attitude. Let every one of us please his neighbor for his good to edification, trying to help and serve and build up others, even as Christ pleased not himself. As it is written, the reproaches of them that reproached you fell on me. That applied to Christ. Whatsoever things were written aforetime, the things that were written in times past were written for our learning that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. When you look at the whole panorama of God's plan, when you go through the scriptures and you read about the children of Israel in times past and you read as to how God dealt with them in various circumstances, you know why those things are recorded? They're written that we might have hope through the scriptures. We understand that God has a plan and a purpose. And you know, sometimes things can look pretty discouraging. What are you going to base your life on? Are you going to base it on the things that you see around you? Or are you going to base it on what God says? You know, it's pretty simple for us to read some of the sections of Scripture. You can read the book of Esther in a short time. You can read the book of Ruth in a short time. You can uh, read about the, the trials of Joseph there in the... Uh, the book of Genesis. You can read about Daniel and his friends. And you can sit down and you can read those accounts in a matter of minutes. But my friends, my brethren, they didn't go through those events in a matter of minutes. They went through it one day at a time. They went through it day by day, year by year, and they hadn't read the book yet. Job hadn't read the book of Job. Esther hadn't read the book of Esther. Daniel hadn't read the book of Daniel. He lived his life one day at a time, just like you and I have to live ours. Now what you find as you read these stories, as you read these accounts, is sometimes the circumstances around could be pretty overwhelming, pretty discouraging. But that wasn't the end of the story. You see, God had a plan and a purpose, and these things are written down that we, through comfort of the Scriptures, might have hope. Now the God of patience and consolation grant you to be like-minded one toward another according to Christ Jesus, that you might with one mind and one mouth glorify God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Wherefore receive you one another, as Christ also received us to the glory of God. So Paul goes on and he talks about that and he says that... Uh, uh, you know, the God of hope, uh, verse 13, fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope through the power of the Holy Spirit. You know, the Apostle Paul was uh, committed and he laid out God's plan, God's purpose. And he talks to the brethren here as to what they are to do. Notice back in Romans chapter 12. He said in Romans 12, 1, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Present yourselves to God. A living sacrifice. Don't be conformed to the world. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So you can prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. I say through the grace given unto me to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think. Think soberly, as God has dealt to every man a measure of faith. We have many members in one body. All members don't have the same office. We being many are one body in Christ, 
everyone members one of another, having gifts differing according to the grace that is given unto us. It's not just one spiritual gift. There are a number of spiritual gifts. And you know, every member of the body has value. There are no vestigial organs in the body of Christ. You know, back at the beginning of the 20th century, a lot of the uh, scientists, the, the medical doctors, uh, influenced by Darwin's theory of evolution and a lack of knowledge about the various uh, organs in the human body, made a list of what they considered vestigial organs. In other words, things that really didn't have a purpose. They were sort of left over when you, from when you were a monkey. And they didn't really have a purpose anymore. That was what they thought. Well, you know, as the, as the decades passed through the 20th century, that list got shorter and shorter. Simply because they began to understand some things that they hadn't previously understood about what this organ did and what that organ did. The point that God makes is we're all part of the body of Christ. But you know there are no vestigial organs in the body of Christ. Every member is important. And we, if we have the approach that God has, we will value everyone. We will value uh, our neighbor. We'll value our brother and our sister. Uh, we will value all of God's people and not look and say, well, you know, we don't really need you. We don't really need you. There are different gifts. And so he goes through and he talks about various ones various gifts and, and the way that we ought to utilize the gift that we're given. He said in verse 9, Let love be without dissimulation. Abhor that which is evil, cleave to that which is good. Be kindly affectioned one to another with brotherly love, in honor preferring one another. Not slothful in business, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. You know, we're told here that we are to evidence God's Spirit. You know, prior to the outpouring of God's Spirit, the disciples were all with one accord in one place. There was an attitude. There was a spirit of love, of unity, of zeal. Now, the kind of love that God is after is not just paying lip service. It's not just going around saying, oh, I love everybody. Oh, I sure love the brethren. You know, what we're told uh, back here in, in uh, uh, 1 John where we're told to love one another, and uh, we're told that uh, uh, we're not just simply to love uh, in, uh, uh, in word or tongue, but we're to love in deed and in truth. Uh, we're told in 1 John chapter 4 and verse 8, He that loves not knows not God, for God is love. In verse 11, uh, Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought to love one another. We're told that God is love, in verse 16. He that dwells in love dwells in God, and God in Him. So, we're, we have explained to us about the, uh, the love of God, uh, that uh, we're not, as it says in, in 1 John 3, 18, My little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. You know, it's not enough to just say that we love. It ought to be reflected in our actions, our actions toward God and our actions toward one another. The disciples were all gathered together in one accord in one place. There was a spiritual unity. There was a love and a kindness and a concern. They were drawing close to God. And if you draw close to God, it will be reflected, it will be evidenced in the way you treat others. You can't be close to God, really walking with God, and uh, uh, have your marriage in a shambles and, and all sorts of problems in your family and problems with the way you treat others and uh, be hostile to other members at church and, and anybody. You know, if we're close to God, we're going to evidence the attitude that God has. God is love. Now, if we go back, let's just notice a little earlier back here in uh, 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter uh, 12 the Apostle Paul uh, picks up this matter of uh, uh, talking here about uh, the uh, gifts of the Spirit. And so he tells us here in 1 Corinthians, uh, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, 
Uh, verse 1, now concerning spiritual gifts, I don't want you to be ignorant. You know, these people came out of a pagan background, many of those in Corinth, and they did, there were a lot of things they didn't understand. He went on to explain their diversities of gifts, their different kinds of gifts, but it's the same Spirit, verse 4. So he talks about some of these various gifts of the Spirit. And he said in verse 13, By one Spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Gentiles, all part of one body. The body is not one uh, member, but many. And there's no member of the body that is unneeded. You know, the foot can't say to the hand, I don't need you. Uh, you know, what part of your body do you want to cut off, do you want to get rid of? Every part of the body has value. So, God has set, verse 18, every member, uh, He set the members, every one of them. He set them in the body as it pleases Him. So he goes down through chapter 12 and tells us that we're to have the same care one for another in verse uh, 25. When one member suffers, all the members suffer. Now, you know, you know that in your physical body. You get up in the middle of the night uh, and you stub your little toe. The little toe doesn't look real impressive. It may not seem as one of the most important members of the body, but I'll guarantee you when you get up and trip over something in the middle of the night, uh, you very quickly find out what it means when it says one, if one member of the body suffers, the whole body suffers. Because you hurt from the top of your head to the bottom of your feet. When one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. He says, you are the body of Christ, verse 27, and members in particular. So he goes through, he talks about these gifts, and then he says, I want to show you the most excellent way. Chapter 13, regardless of the gift I have, if I speak with the tongue of men and of angels, and I have not love, I am become a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. You know, now abides faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is love. That's what it says in verse 13. Then, chapter 14, follow after love and desire spiritual gifts, but rather that you may prophesy. Speaking of speaking under inspiration of God. Do you realize that love precedes spiritual gifts? You know, the disciples were ready when God's time came. Moses looked forward to, he anticipated, he desired that the Spirit would be available to all. It wasn't in his day. Joel prophesied of a specific time when it would be poured out on all flesh. Peter stood up and announced that that time had come. And it was poured out. It was the early rain, the former rain, the great outpouring of God's Spirit at the beginning of the New Testament era. Now there have been gifts of the Spirit and there have been miracles down through time, sometimes more, sometimes less. But there is coming yet another great miraculous outpouring that has not occurred in that fashion since the earliest days uh, right after Pentecost and the days right after. That time is coming. You know, the issue is not that you and I can control the timing of it. It's not a matter of working ourselves up into some uh, emotional pseudo-spiritual experience. It is a matter of walking with God, of drawing close to God. And if you and I are drawing close to God, we will be also drawing close to one another. You see... Chapter 13 in the book of 1 Corinthians, the love chapter, precedes chapter 14 that says, follow after love and desire spiritual gifts. You and I right now ought to be in the situation that the disciples were in prior to the day of Pentecost. They were gathering in one accord, in one place. They were pouring out their hearts to God. They were seeking God. They had a job to do and they knew that they needed the power of God to carry it out. They were seeking God. And you know, that showed up in their unity with one another. They cared about one another. They helped one another. They served one another. They were willing to give and to sacrifice because they knew that when one member suffered, they all suffered. They felt it. It wasn't put on. It wasn't artificial. It was real. They had that love and concern, the love and concern of God. 
And when God's time came, suddenly the Spirit was poured out. Brethren, there is coming a latter day outpouring of the Spirit and great miraculous things. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Uh, the old men will dream dreams. The young men will see visions. Uh, upon my handmaidens will I pour out the Spirit in those days, says the Lord. There is coming the most dramatic outpouring of the Spirit of God that has been seen since the days of the beginning of the New Testament church in the context of the day of the Lord, in the context of, of final end time events. Go through and read it in Joel 2 and 3 and just look at the context. There was a former fulfillment, an early fulfillment in Acts 2. Peter quoted that. You know, the heavenly signs. I mean, you go through in the book of Revelation, the sixth seal is open. There are great dramatic signs in the heavens. My brethren, you and I cannot control when God pours out His Spirit in that way. But what we can do and what we should do is ensure by our conduct, by our seeking God, that we are vessels fit for the Master's use. That we are vessels that have yielded ourselves to Him from the heart. So that when God's time comes, He can fill us to the brim. You know, the Spirit is available to all who seek it through faith and repentance right now. But there is coming a time of miraculous outpouring. You know, Daniel explains back in Daniel chapter 11 that the people that know their God shall be strong and do exploits. You can't start with the exploits. There's a three-part process. The people that do know their God shall be strong and do exploits. Sometimes we want to start with the exploits. What we need to do is start with knowing God. Really coming to know God and to walk with Him and to serve Him and to know Him in a personal sense. And as we do that, it will be evidenced in our dealings with one another. We can be, we should be, a people prepared for the Lord. We should be a vessel that is suitable for the Master's use. And when the time comes, God will fill those vessels that are ready. He will fill them to the brim with His Holy Spirit. And He will accomplish and finish the work that He has set forth to do. You and I are a part of that progression of people with whom God has worked. We're here celebrating the day of Pentecost. A time that commemorates the beginning of the, fir the, the first fruits harvest, a time that reminds us of when God's law was given and ultimately when the Spirit that enables us to keep the law in the Spirit was poured out. God's Spirit through which He will accomplish and finish His work. You and I are in that prelude to the greatest, most dramatic outpouring that we could even imagine. It's important and it's vital that we draw close to God and that we be ready to be used of Him.